During the last weekend of July, tens of thousands of fans flocked to Northern Michigan for one of the greatest races on earth. It's a punishing yet thrilling endurance event that tests every physical and mental aspect of its racers. The Consumer's Energy Osable River Canoe Marathon. Our story begins in Homer, Michigan, home of the Barton family farm since 1974. For some, these 4,600 acres are known for pig farming. For others, they're better known as the training grounds for one of the most successful paddling teams in the Consumers Energy Asabo River Canoe Marathon history, hog wild racing. For decades, the farm has produced some of the greatest paddlers in America something Bruce Barton credits to his parents, who got him into racing years ago. I bought a canoe when I was seven years old, saved my money all one summer. My mom and dad would drop us off on the river and then pick us up later in the day. And when my mom and dad started canoe racing, I just thought that was the greatest thing. It was a good time in Michigan. There was lots of good paddlers. Like you see, Ralph Sawyer and Stanley Hall were racing, big John Baker and Jack Kolka, and Jeff and Jerry Kellogg. So I you know, really idolized those people. And they were nice to young kids, you know, they gave us some time. I had can race friends, and that's how I met my wife. I've been racing since 1969. I haven't missed a year yet. I met Bruce through canoe racing in Indiana, and we were both 12 years old at the time. We actually raced against each other in 1970. My brother and I were first, and Roxanne and her partner were second. Roxanne says that uh, she got in better shape and was ready two weeks later, but we didn't show. <laughs> From that day forward, Bruce and Roxanne started to build something special. On the farm, they continued to grow the family's business. In the water, they took their family's hobby to new heights. Racing kayaks and canoes on the biggest stages in the world, the Barton name became synonymous with success. They showed everyone what hard work and dedication could accomplish. And it's something their daughter Rebecca took notice of from the riverbanks. My earliest memories paddling were watching my parents compete all over Michigan and all over the country. I would get so excited seeing all the paddlers that I would just be cheering for everyone, thinking they're my parents, just chasing them around and enjoying being outside and on the river. While Rebecca grew up on the farm and around canoeing, it wasn't always something she envisioned herself being a part of. That is until she went away to college and realized that something was missing. I really miss like being part of like a sports team because I always played sports in high school. So I called my parents up and I'm like, I think I want to race next year. And my dad was, he didn't want to race with me because he didn't think I would train enough. Rebecca proved her dad wrong and longed enough hours in the canoe to join him in her first Asable River Canoe Marathon at just 20 years of age. She really took off after it and she's one of the best women in North America now and her strategy in racing, her technique, her, her handling of the canoe is as good as anybody there is, any man or woman. That makes me feel proud. My dad instilled in us that if you're going to compete you had to be in shape and you had to train. That's what we do, you know, we, we paddle and, and race. And we have a really good training program and it's all year long. We love to weight lift, we love to run, we love to cross country ski, and we love to paddle and it's just kind of how it started. Young men are in the 240 mile Osable Canoe Marathon. Behind them, screaming in the background, are their support teams, their families, their friends, their loved ones who will follow them the 240 miles from Grayling to Oscoda down on Lake Huron. It's the longest, toughest. Most it started during a morning cup of coffee between Frank Davis and Howard Brubaker in Oscoda, Michigan, back in 1947. While discussing ways to draw tourists to the Asabo River Valley, the idea of running a non-stop canoe marathon from Grayling to Oscoda was born. Some said it could never be done, but Frank, Howard, Ray Snyder, and a canoe salesman had other thoughts. Those thoughts became a reality on Saturday, September 6, 1947, in front of Ray's canoe livery in Grayling. Forty-six teams entered the Asabo River and the world's greatest marathon canoe race was born. For the first decade of its existence, the race would be known as the 240-mile Michigan Canoe Championship. Of the 46 teams that entered the river that day, only 15 canoes crossed the finish line. Alan Carr and Delbert Case, both of Grayling, became the first winners 
and earn $500 for their 21 hours, three minutes of effort. More importantly, they proved that the Asabo could be conquered. Now, 75 years later, the race we see today takes on a perception that its founders could have only dreamed of. Fundamentally, it's the same. Teams of two race canoes nonstop from Ray's Canoe Livery to downtown Escoda before the river meets Lake Huron. Now, don't get me wrong. There have been plenty of changes through the years, and people have argued for decades about this and about that. But at its core, the now properly calculated 120-mile Consumers Energy Asable River Canoe Marathon remains the same. It's a tradition that has brought communities together, helped mold families, broken down barriers, and for some of the legends in the marathon's history, this race has been something special since the day they first saw it. I was there for the first marathon, you know, because I grew up in Oscoda, so everybody around Oscoda would be a paddler sooner or later. Frank Smutek's 22 marathon career began in 1952. The 1950s were mostly dominated by local paddlers like Ralph Sawyer, Jerry Wagner, and Ron Homan. During these years, crowds of up to 50,000 gathered up and down the river to watch their favorite local racers. That excitement hooked five-time champion Butch Stockton immediately. I just graduated from college. I got my draft deferment for six weeks. So I knew I wasn't going to Vietnam and I'd come up to my brother's house. They were all getting ready to go to the marathon. And I said, I'd never been there. We're sitting out there watching you and Jack, Jeff's dad come through there. We drove home and then my brother said, hey, you want to go over and watch the finish? So we drove all the way to Oscoda about four o'clock in the morning. I kind of remember this thing called a canoe that was in the yard and they're always doing this work on it here and there. And I didn't know what it was all about, you know what I mean? And my dad, he raced it quite a bit. and then. People in town talking about, who are you? Oh, I'm Jeff Coco. Who's your dad? Jack Coco. Oh, you're Jack Coco's son, huh? And that's all you heard as you grew up, you know what I mean? So you kind of grew up in the shadow of your dad for quite a while. <laughs> for these marathon legends, the most difficult shadows they had to chase were those along the Asabo through the pitch dark night. With endless obstacles, challenging weather conditions, and a million things that could go wrong, perhaps the biggest question is why? You know, to start and you want to finish it, you're racing the river, you know, you really don't, you're not really worried about, you know, do I beat so-and-so or whoever my goal is to finish the race. I know it gets hard sometimes too when you get the areas where you got three or four teams that are capable to win that race. So there's only one of them going to win that race, but you got, you know, you got some really good teams out there. The competition on the Asable is always fierce. But what makes the marathon unique is the fan support the paddlers experience from start to finish. First, remember at the, at the start of the marathon, that adrenaline feed, the first time I did it, I just was so jacked, man. And then you, it felt like electricity was in the air. Then you start learning to focus and narrow it down like you do, you know what I mean? When I forgot in the marathon, that I never thought Oscoda. I thought Stefan's Bridge. And then that was the pickup of the people there. Now it's Wakeley's. You just paddle it in sections. Yep. Paddle it in sections. Yep. Break it down. And you don't think, mm. oh, I got 16 hours. <laughs> 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 I started deciding not to get fed at the bridges or the big landings as I paddle with Al. And he'd miss his feed because he'd just get wild when we'd come to a bridge and he'd just start paddling harder and harder and he'd see lights and people screaming and the, he, oh, here we go, that was the fastest 10 minutes of the for that Bridge paddler, you just look at him going into the bridge, why aren't they winning, look how fast they're going. I know it. Racing from bridge to bridge through the night is something all our legends agree stands out about the marathon. For those lucky enough to survive the darkness, Morning light brings new challenges, as paddlers must now navigate the remaining four consumers' energy hydroelectric dams, no matter what conditions await. I recall it was 93 with Bill again when we were way ahead of schedule on the stuff. We went over Alcona, went down there, and there was no water. It was a creek down there because they hadn't released the dam yet. You know what I mean? They, they, didn't, they weren't constantly on a constant flow then. They would release them at certain times, and we're going, oh, no, this is no good. <laughs> you well, know, yeah, the gravel bars are sticking way up the, and everything. That's one thing that's that they talk change. about, 
you know, the old, old racers is time it, whether they had yeah. water or not. You yeah. know, they, they, they didn't know. I remember mean, you guys talking about the evolution of the sport in itself. I think everyone here has raced this canoe race with the wooden paddles and wood strip canoes and all that. And then it's evolved now into the carbon fiber stuff. You guys recall some of the old days with the wooden paddles and stuff like that? When your dad and I were, the only way to get a canoe was build it, you know. Oh, yeah. That's... And so I built several canoes with your dad, but he always would get the forms. And I teased him. I said, the canoes you build, Jack, have more bumps and humps in them than a Parker House roll. <laughs> Just... The marathon was not immune to these bumps and humps either. Despite the early success in the 50s, the marathon ran into some tumultuous years during the 1960s, with the different towns along the river arguing over starting times, dates, positions, and even the starting line location the race quickly lost momentum. In 1966, only 14 teams participated, and the decade culminated in the marathon being canceled for the first time in 1969. In 1970, the race was back on, and once again it became non-stop from Grayling to Oscoda. The famous Le Mans start became a permanent fixture for the event that year, and it wasn't the only addition to the race that would leave a lasting mark. I remember the year Claude and Serge came here and everybody was not going to let them win. And they tore a hole in their cedar boat about that long and about that wide. We got down in just below Camp 10 where you go by, you can go either way around that island. And I could see this light shining up in the air. And I couldn't figure out what it was. And we got up there and it was Serge and Claude and they had the boat up in the air. And the light was shining up and they were draining the water out of it. And Al says, well, hey, there's one more team down. That boat featured the French-Canadian brothers of Serge and Claude Corbin, who made an immediate impact on the marathon upon arrival. In 1970, Claude posted a record-setting time with teammate Luke Robillard, becoming the first two-man out-of-state team to capture the championship. The two had never seen the river prior to that race. This marked the first time a team won the marathon on their very first attempt, outside of the inaugural race in 1947, of course. When Serge joined Claude in 1974, the Canadian presence could not be ignored on the river, despite how the local paddlers felt about them. We'd go through the stumps and we're coming across the long straight to the dam and you hear this whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. And I look, and here's Claude right here. Serge and Claude went on to win that 1979 race, and they quickly became two of the most successful paddlers in the marathon's history, with Serge ultimately capturing 18 titles in all. The Corbins helped change the race's dynamic, opening up to the most elite paddlers from all around the world, while also putting an end to the mindset that Americans and Canadians couldn't paddle together. My marathon training throughout the year includes weight training, running, and jiu-jitsu. Jiu-jitsu, I found, it's a very technical sport, just like paddling. Ten-minute rounds don't sound like much. Well, go, go wrestle for ten minutes, and it, you'll see how in shape you are. Then it boils down to being in these situations where technique will override strength. That's the same with paddling. You can be the toughest guy in the world, but can't make a canoe go. I grew up here in Grayling, and we would go down to the banks of the Sable, you know, Burton's Landing. I remember my mom was like, oh, we don't drive into town during Canoe Marathon Week because it, the traffic's so bad. I mean, we grew up on a horse farm way out in the sticks, and so when we would make it to town to see what's going on, the big hype and everything, it was, it was always pretty exciting for us. I remember the first time I ever seen like Serge Corbin and Jeff Coca in the flesh, you know, they're walking down the streets and I was like, that's Serge, you know, the, the greatest of all time. Watching the start of the marathon as a kid, that was super exciting, just get us all amped up. You know, afterwards we all wanted to paddle and then we'd go back to our farm life. The excitement the marathon brings to Grayling every year is palpable. From parades to family gatherings, the marathon marks a moment in time each July that puts this small Michigan town on the map. For locals like Ryan and Rod Halstead, that excitement had them hooked from a young age. Fast forward to 2023, 
and Ryan is one of the favorites to win both the 75th Consumers Energy Asabo River Canoe Marathon and the Triple Crown of Racing Canoe titles. The Triple Crown consists of three of the oldest and most prestigious marathon canoe races in the world. It starts with the General Clinton Canoe Regatta in Cooperstown, New York in late May. It continues with the Asable in late July and concludes with the La Classique in Quebec in September. While Ryan chases these lofty goals today, he does not forget how it all started. We were just young at the time. I mean, I was 14 and uh, my brother was 15 and we were shining boots out at Camp Grayling back when that was a thing and just shined a whole bunch of boots, you know, as much money as we could make and we bought our first boat. From that moment forward, Ryan and Rod became obsessed with paddling. With the help of Fred Mills, Tom Brooks, Al Whiting Sr., and Bernie Dzinski, the two brothers spent the summer of 2002 training and preparing to live out their childhood dream of competing in the marathon. If it wasn't for those guys, like we definitely wouldn't have finished our first canoe marathon. You know, we're just 120 pounds soaking wet, just two little kids. I look at the pictures today and I was think, man, how did I finish it? And my parents distilled in us at a young age of like hard work ethic. So the gun went off in 2002. We, we rolled on down the Sable and just kept looking for checkpoints, knocking off Burton's knocking off the Stefans, feeds that we had back then. I'm eating ravioli and it's all over your paddle, it's all over your shirt. Like you still got, back then it was like 16 more hours. You had to race down the river with spaghetti sauce all over everything. So it's just, it's funny to look back and think about those things like when we first started. After the first marathon, we were just like super ecstatic. Like the next year we wanted to beat Serge and Jeff. <laughs> you know, <laughs> two, two young kids like, with not very much knowledge versus guys that have been paddling their whole life. Those kids would continue to make a steady push up the leaderboards in the coming years, coming as close as second in 2006. But after years of competing together, Rod decided to focus on his growing family, and he stepped away from paddling. In 2016, Ryan decided to team up with Canadian Christopher Perot in hopes of finally capturing his first victory. With Rod now working as the team's feed captain, the group found themselves within a finish line spread of the victory that had eluded them for over a decade. The marathon's popularity continued to grow through the 1970s. With the exciting new rivalries drawing crowds up and down the river, the race began to capture the interest of a new generation. And this time, it wasn't just the men who took notice. Just a minute, just a minute, back. Come on in. So they know they're gonna go when they see a harness. That's their key right there. It's kind of like paddlers when they see a canoe. I know it. Here you go. Ready? Let's go. Good job. My first memory is watching it with my dad, and that would have been in 1967. And I saw it by Borchers and Penrod's canoe livery. I said that's what I wanted to do. <laughs> and that was always my goal from then on. My dad built wooden canoes at the time, wooden boats too. And so he helped me build my first canoe. Back then it was Buzzy Peterson and his son and Jerry Jeff Kellogg and John Baker. Those were the names back then. And then as they evolved into the 70s, when I was still watching it, it started a little bit of just small canoe races. They were probably the people I looked up to the most. Inspired by the greats of the time, Lynn followed their advice in preparing for her very first marathon. It was 1980, I had helped pit crew and I had been at many races before that. And I was told by then, make sure you've done, and we did, we did some local races from 1974 to 1980. When I signed up, I had no idea what I was signing up for other than this is what I wanna do. And it was gonna be one and done and I just kept going. And a record 42 consecutive races later, Lynn Woody continues to keep going. Her name is now etched throughout the marathon record books, as she is unquestionably regarded as the most successful female in the race's history. Lynn has played a vital role in helping change the perception of who can be successful on the river, but she's not alone. During the first two decades of the marathon, 
the rules did not permit women to enter. That all changed, however, in 1968 when Marilyn Wagner teamed up with her husband Jerry in the amateur division to become the first woman to enter and complete the race. In 1973, Donna Buckley and Truda Gilbert were the first two-woman team, the first women's team to enter the professional division, and the first women to complete a full-length marathon. Contrast those years to 2022, when 19 mixed and six women's teams entered the marathon. And while Lynn doesn't take credit for the changes herself, she is certainly aware of what it means for the future of women's paddling. It was unusual to have a female partner. It was very unusual to have a female team. And as that's changed, it's fun to see, it's good to see. And the more young kids, the more young adults, Rebecca Davis now. And we look at that and, I, and you know, I think that's true in, the, in every sport. We're seeing more and more females. It's great to see that they don't feel intimidated anymore. It's not like, oh, I can't do this. They don't just have to be standing on the sidelines wishing. So winter training for me is different than for a lot of people. <laughs> Normally I would be out looking for snow every day where some paddlers are looking for water. I have sled dogs and I do like to run them competitively. I started in the fall with 10 mile runs, kind of like canoeing, and I ended up doing a 120 mile race and I did some 40 mile runs and 30 mile runs. So I spent most of my days taking care of sled dogs. Carrying their food buckets was my way of lifting, I said. My canoeing gave me experience with dog sledding, how to work and how to live in distance competitively. And then equally, my dog racing really helped me to learn that even in canoeing, it's a training process. I have to get there, eight to 10 dogs going in the right direction. And so it helps me in canoeing to realize like, there's two of us, but we need to still work together. My training is probably stronger now in canoeing because of dog racing, because I have to be attentive to the dogs and pay attention to them, and so it, it's easier to pay attention in canoe racing now, too. With the mushing season now behind her, Lynn will begin preparing for a record 43rd marathon. And while most paddlers are still working out who will be their partner for the 75th, Lynn's new teammate, Mike Kellogg, brings a unique tie to her past. Hey. Hello, can you hear me? I can hear you just fine. Good deal. So I'm hoping the snow melts here soon. It'll look easier to paddle, won't it? It'll look easier. Just been uh, trying to get the the weight program back on track and, you know, working out downstairs on the paddle machine and get rid of the snow and get going. I agree. You, you can be like the musher behind me this year? Yeah, 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 yeah. I, give, I, can, get, I can sing really good and I, can, I got a little song when they go up the hills. Um, and then suck water, and um, I, I, I got a, I had a male as my leader, so I said add a boy all the time, so I can keep saying that. Okay, there you go. There you go. We got to get together this spring, and uh, I'll be in touch, and we'll yep. get together. Perfect. Me too. Thank all you. Right. Thanks. Have a good day. All right. Talk to you later. Okay. Bye bye. Bye. This is my first marathon without my mother. She just passed away. So this will be my first race without her by my side. My mother supported me from step one. She fitted me for every single marathon. She was there at the starting line. She was there at the finish line waiting for me, always with a smile. She was always very proud of me, no matter what my result was. It'll be a hard year to get through, but it motivates me that much more. It makes me that much more excited to race again. Just wishing that she could be there, but knowing she'll be there in spirit. The 2023 paddling season will be one of the most difficult of Mike Davis's career. Last year's General Clinton and La Classique champion and one of the sport's most elite athletes will face a challenge like he's never faced before. He'll be searching for his first career marathon without his mother by his side. But this member of the Hogwild Racing family will not be without a huge support system. Mike moved to the farm to be with his wife, Rebecca, when he was just 20 years old. The two met through the Asable Marathon, and now with their son, Jack, they've set lofty goals of carrying on their family's legacy, both in the river and on the farm. 
The love and support they show one another will not replace what's been lost, but it will help as they look to carry on and move forward. As a young man growing up in Grayling, Mike learned how to handle the twists and the turns of life and the river, but it wasn't until he arrived on the farm that he learned how to put it all together. Training with Bruce and Roxanne, and uh, for a while, Tim Trebold was here, Rebecca's uncle. They've just helped me really fine tune the things so when I do get in the races and I've been moving up, I know what to expect as I've gone from fighting for top 15s to top 10s to top fives. Which should come as no surprise to those familiar with hog wild racing. The tradition of excellence at the farm has helped develop former ensemble champions such as Matthew Reimer, Andy Trebold, and countless other men and women who've had success during the marathon. Whatever's in the water in Homer is exactly what another rising star, Danny Medina, was in search of when he moved to the farm for work and to improve his paddling. Bruce is just a, a great coach and he's always giving me tips on form and how to move better in different kinds of water. And just being around these guys, like being around Mike and trying to keep up with him when we're training, that, that'll make you fast right there. They're so hungry and they want to get better and they figure a lot of this stuff out on themselves. I try to help them a little bit, try not to over help them, but you know, I go out with Danny, I'll tell him some things that I think he could work on, some things that I think he's really improved on. Having the farm has made us extremely organized. It helps us with our training because we're so scheduled. I think the success is built over years. You have to have a really good base, you have to have a lot of muscle memory, and the knowledge and the skill is really important. Our family culture has really been, you know, family first, and then the farm and paddling are, are all really intertwined. It's very natural for us to all be there supporting each other, and what you see at the finish line, that's how we are every day. We're spending that time together, and we just really do celebrate each other's big wins and, and small ones, or just even feeling like you had a good race. It's not even about the position you finish. I mean, we all have goals, but it's, you know, feeling like you were able to accomplish what you wanted to accomplish and, and get from your body what you needed that day. To be successful in anything, you have to be committed. You know, so we work hard in the farm, we get up early, you know, we have a schedule of what we gotta get done. And, you know, everybody works pretty hard here. And it's the same with training for canoe racing. You have to take it seriously, put the time in and try to get better. It's a lot of fun having those young guys around because that keeps me going. Otherwise, uh, that'd probably fade away. However, this marathon vet with seven top five finishes won't be fading away anytime soon. Nor will the rest of the Barton family, as they all plan to race in the 75th Canoe Marathon this summer. While they continue to train and work out who their teammates will be, one thing is for sure, they plan to all be there together as a family, no matter what life throws their way.